from the trash. And once I got that, of course, I needed uh, the other side, which was the Cubans sent their expeditionary force to Angola to counter the South Africans who weren't there. And uh, so uh, I, one of my friends in Cuba got me that cover. So that's a sample of how I managed to collect when I didn't have any money to put into my collection. Uh, since then, of course, I've, I've been more able to acquire uh, what I wanted. So let's go next to the top of the world. I, I have here this, this map which we can use to position everything. Those first things were right from there and uh, from there. Uh, but now, now we're at the top of the world, the North Pole. This is uh, a, a map uh, copied from National Geographic in 1953. And you notice this, uh, this loopy uh, track. That's the, that's the route of the drift map, it's called, of the drift chart of an ice island. Which, which was known as Fletcher's Ice Island, or T3, uh, where the United States built a, uh, a base to do uh, geological and, and weather research in the, in the North Pole. Just go dead. Now, you notice the, the, the uh, latitude uh, lines on there, the, the inner circle that, uh, uh, that's that's 80 degrees north, and the North Pole, of course, is 90 degrees north. So while the U.S. Army Air Force was, was following the, what they call the gyre, the, the uh, circular drift float of this ice island, uh, it was coming around and getting closer to the North Pole by the time they put their base on it. I'm not sure if everybody knows what an ice island is. Uh, basically, it's, it's the edge of a glacier from Ellesmere Island, Canada, that broke off and floated into the Arctic Ocean. And the consequence of it is it's fresh water floating in salt water. So it's harder, higher, and uh, you can actually treat it like an island and build a base on it while the, the uh, uh, flow ice is, is uh, Lower and, and uh, squishier and, and softer and so on. How big is it, Ken? Uh, well, it varies, of course. It probably doesn't exist anymore, but it was pretty big then. Uh, you know how big it was? I, I don't remember. I, I, it, it's in the article. Uh, and an awful lot has been written about it. But anyway, you can notice that at the time this, this ends in January 53, uh, T3 was about less than 200 miles from the North Pole, which is considerably closer than any of the, the land masses. Uh, Spitsbergen is over here. Uh, Franz Joseph Land and, and so on. Uh, Ellesmere is, is closer. Greenland, the edge of Greenland is the closest land. But, uh, but anyway, uh, that, that's where it was in January of, of uh, 1953. So here's a cover from T3 in January 1953. That's a pretty cool polar cover. Um, but polar collectors also like everything from, from the north. Uh, this one uh, is from 1968, and, and this has a, a kind of philatelic twist because uh, our colleague uh, <clears throat> John Barwis was stationed at T3 when this cover uh, was sent, and one of his duties, not, not with this cover, but with most of the mail that came in, was that he had to put the, the, uh, uh, the coordinates, uh, latitude and longitude coordinates on the envelopes and, and cache them before they were sent to the collectors of wandering. This is, a, this is actually a piece of non-philatelic mail, but the, the world is pretty much blooded with philatelic covers uh, from these places. Now, once we uh, get that far, uh, I thought I ought to have a, a cover from the northernmost city in the world, which is uh, Longyearbyen on uh, Spitsbergen 
it's it's I guess the capital of its of its province. It's a town that it was once called just Longyear Town because it was formed by an American named Longyear, oddly. Uh, but uh, you can tell from the cancel that they are very proud about the fact that they're the northernmost uh, town in the world. Uh, this is again a piece of nine philatelic mail, just a commercial cover of Oslo, which is kind of nice. And from there, I'll leap to what claims to be the southernmost town in the world, uh, Ushuaia, uh, Argentina, on Tierra del Fuego. Uh, but in this case, uh, the, the location is contested because you can see from this map, Ushuaia is here, Argentina, but Chile comes down below it across the, uh, the Beagle Channel. Uh, and Puerto Williams asserts its claim. Here's a better map to see the, how uh, Chile comes down below Argentina. So here's a Puerto Williams uh, cover, which I think uh, helps me with that. Now going back to this map for a minute, uh, most people who like polar stuff also like the South Atlantic Islands. There's the, uh, the Falklands. And of course, the Falkland Islands uh, dependencies and uh, St. Helena are, are areas that uh, collectors of, of that geography like. This is kind of an interesting one. This is, a, again, just an ordinary cover. That stamp looks like a Christmas stamp, but really, that's the saint for whom uh, the island is named. And here's a South Georgia cover. Now, this one's addressed to me. This is, of course, uh, one of the fairly typical ways of getting covers for your collection where uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, commercial mail or, or dealer stocks. So I want to just uh, get somebody who's there to, uh, to make, up a, make up a pretty cover and send it to you, and uh, you've got uh, quite a gem. Uh, South Georgia, I believe, is where Shackleton eventually got rescued uh, after his uh, epic survival trek uh, across Antarctica. Here's a, uh, one of our own Navy bases at Little America, uh, Antarctica, uh, but we also had a, uh, a station at the South Pole. So uh, from the top of the world to the bottom, uh, you can travel more easily uh, but as a collector than you can uh, following a cruise. Now I want to uh, switch to some enclaves in Asia for a moment. And we're way over here in, in, uh, in eastern Siberia, just north of the Chinese border on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. This is just an ordinary piece of, of Soviet postal stationery of, of 1948, but, the, but it was mailed from Birobidjan, the uh, Jewish autonomous uh, whatever they call it, oblast uh, in, in, uh, in the east uh, that uh, predated Israel by 20 years as, as a Jewish homeland. It's actually addressed to <coughs> excuse me, the, the Israeli embassy in, in Moscow in, in 1949. So it's, it's kind of a nice thing. Now, across the Chinese border, then, we have another enclave. These stamps are of the of the Northeast China Liberation Area. This is a, a 1947 cover uh, when uh, China was still at least nominally under the governance of the nationalists, but an awful lot of it uh, had been liberated by the communists and was in every respect governed, and particularly postally, uh, by them, and they issued stamps for each of the enclaves that they controlled. So this from Harbin going to uh, Zurich, I think, is a, uh, certainly a prize find for, for my collection. Um, so once again, these are, these are not places where people normally think of going uh, on their honeymoons or, or uh, uh, Caribbean uh, vacations. But uh, now I want to go to Europe and look at, at some neat places in Europe. 
I, of course, have covers from all of the micro states. I think many of us do. Uh, uh, San Marino, Monaco, Liechtenstein, Andorra, and so on. But uh, there are some even, and the Vatican, but there are some even more unusual places. This is the only uh, ostensibly postal item I've ever seen from Basque country. Northern Spain and Southern France, that uh, uh, some of whose people strive for independence, uh, never getting very far and spending a lot of time in prison, but uh, nevertheless, they, they have their flag and they have their their zeal and they have their postal stationery. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's a cool item. Now, how about this one? This is from uh, the Eastern Aegean. Uh, from Rhodes to Leros uh, under Nazi occupation yeah. during World War II. Uh, I think that's an extraordinary, it's registered too. Uh, it's probably philatelic, but I'll tell you I haven't seen another one, so uh, I'm extraordinarily happy to, to have it as part of my world tour. And here's another enclave that I, that's a favorite of mine. This is the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. Uh, I showed you the Rhodes cover a minute ago because uh, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta was, was actually headquartered at Rhodes during the Crusades. Uh, but they were eventually driven out uh, to Malta. And then they were driven out of Malta, so now they have their headquarters in Rome. But they still enjoy extraterritorial uh, sovereignty. <clears throat> they have postal treaties with 55 countries, not including the United States. So if you want to get a real cover uh, from SMOM, uh, you have to get it addressed to a country that they have an actual postal treaty with. So this one uh, is a registered cover to Nicaragua, uh, properly franked and, and uh, properly postmarked and, and received and, and so forth. I actually have the registered receipt as well to go with it. Now we're going to go next uh, to the Balkans for a moment. This this is from the. It's, it's a Belgian military team, but they, they are the United Nations Protective Force in Croatia. Again, at least at that time, not a place that you would have been likely to visit. Uh, but, uh, but certainly the source of a, a very interesting piece of coastal history. And here's, here's my final one, because, because even enclaves don't get quite <clears throat> this difficult. <clears throat> Uh, this is from the Polish Navy during World War II. Of course, the Polish Navy didn't have a country uh, because their country was, was occupied and dismembered <clears throat> by Germany and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, so the Navy headquarters was in London. Nevertheless, uh, being particularly eager to retain their, their national identity and claim to sovereignty and governance, they issued their own postage and used their own postage on mail uh, throughout the war. So even though uh, there's no territorial uh, origin for a cover like that, it's a great cover to have. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to go to Central Africa to see some areas of contested uh, uh, sovereignty. And, and, uh, the, one of the great struggles with, uh, of the uh, 1960 and 61 was the independence of the Belgian Congo uh, under Patrice Lumumba, who was assassinated shortly after achieving independence. And meanwhile, the, the various the Belgian uh, owners of, of uh, mineral firms and, and uh, other natural resources pirates set up their own puppet governments uh, in different provinces of the, of the Congo. This one is from the uh, South Kasai 
uh, province, a registered cover, obviously philatelic, to, uh, to Belgium. Uh, probably better known is, is Katanga. Uh, and uh, this is actually a non philatelic cover. And this uh, De Lawrence uh, firm in Chicago is a good source of covers from really weird places in Africa. Uh, because it was a merchant supplying uh, uh, chemicals and, and uh, different kinds of, of uh, substances used in uh, religious rituals, voodoo and whatever. Uh, and so uh, they, they actually got orders from, uh, from very obscure places. And, and, uh, you can still find these covers in dealer stocks, and they're good to have. Finally, before we leave Africa, now we're in South Africa. Uh, the, the last gasp of the apartheid regime in, in South Africa was to create what they called independent homelands for the, uh, for the alleged uh, tribal entities that uh, were not suitable to integrate into the greater South Africa. So this is, that four of them actually issued stamps in postal stationery, Transkei, uh, Siskei, Venda, and Bokuntatswana. So this is a Bokuntatswana postal card, non-philatelic. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I think is politically interesting about it is you notice that it's trilingual, but even though it's a it's ostensibly a Tswana item. The first language is Afrikaans, and the second one is English, and the third language is, is Tswana. So uh, it kind of gives you an idea of who actually <laughs> issued it for, for what reason. <clears throat> but it, again, it's, it's a, and it's of course an enclave that no longer exists uh, because the, uh, the end of apartheid reintegrated all the, the Bantustans into, into the unified South Africa. <coughs> now let's go to the Caribbean for a minute. This is, um, you see that Radio Americas? That, that's, that dot um, off the coast of Honduras is Swan Island. Swan Island was claimed by the United States under the Guano Act in 1853 and continually held until sometime, I think, in the, in the 1970s, it was eventually ceded to Honduras. But during all that time, it's the United States possession, the one incorporated. And I love postal history from, from Swan Island. But it's also got an amazing uh, political history, because uh, this was the place where the Central Intelligence Agency had its propaganda radio station, which is what Radio Americans was, uh, for the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, staffed by Howard Hunt of Watergate fame and David Atlee Phillips. So you could make a Hollywood movie just about, uh, about this particular place. And this is my earliest Swan Island cover, 1946. This is a non philatelic cover uh, from an actual resident uh, of, of the island. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, it was for the benefit of United Fruit Company shipping. It was a, it was a radio and, and weather station. And so United Fruit boats stopped there once a week or once a month whenever they were passing by and carried the outgoing mail to, to Tampa where it entered uh, the U.S. mails. And uh, since it was a U.S. possession, it was entitled to <clears throat> to uh, domestic <clears throat> mail rate. Um, another f uh, source of, of uh, postal history uh, from these obscure places is radio amateur QSL cards. So this, this is, again, posted from Swan Island and, and entered the mail at uh, Tampa, their, um, their terminal. And the Interpex stamp show issued this, uh, this cover in 1961, which was actually flown for them as a favor 
uh, uh, by the CIA's airline. Um, so it's it's amazing what kind of stuff you can find from from weird places if you uh, take a close enough look. Now we'll go to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, when uh, Pan American Airlines uh, built the Trans-Pacific Route to the Orient, uh, the, the stops along the route were uh, Hawaii, Midway Island, Wake Island, Guam, Manila, Hong Kong, Singapore. That's uh, that's the uh, with Macau uh, together with Hong Kong in a little loop. Um, and uh, this is one of the covers that I've written about in the last couple of years. Where it, it's from Wake Island to the United States, paying the unpublished but true 35 cent airman rate. Um, they're quite a bit tougher than you might expect them to be. And as you can see, this one was written by somebody who was a passenger staying at the Pan Am Luxury Hotel at Wake Island. All that came to an end <coughs> uh, in, in December of 1941 when the Japanese captured it. And I wrote about that in this month's lens uh, at some length. <coughs> Midway Island is more collectible, but this is uh, a tough rate, the, the, the rate just from Midway to Hawaii is only 10 cents. And uh, that's a pretty good franking, I would say, uh, as well. But the, the stationery, the, the uh, colorful cacheted envelopes were available to travelers, uh, Pan Am travelers, and, and, and also to the military people stationed at Midway. So it's a, it's a good cover. This is much tougher, though. This is, this is paying the correct 30 cent rate from the United States to Midway. And it's far more difficult to get mail going to Midway than from Midway. So uh, if you have a chance to pick up one of those, you ought to be if you don't like this stuff. <coughs> um, the, the other important US pre-war uh, colony in the Pacific was uh, American Samoa. Um, this is uh, a, a wartime rate that uh, nobody has been able to document for sure. I've been writing about this also in the US Specialist. I'll be writing more about it. Uh, but um, this is what Henry Beecher considered to be the rate, 40 cents uh, per half ounce from, <coughs> from American Samoa to the United States. And uh, I, I certainly agree that a, a majority of the of the covers you find have this frank, this this uh, amount of postage, uh, but I, I question whether there was an actual rate. Uh, I think it's actually the rate from Fiji, uh, mm -hmm. and it was uh, rated as a surface postage. Now here's where where you can get lucky. If you notice, this this is posted at Honolulu, and Jim Forty sold it to me as a as a fairly common. Honolulu postcard, but actually uh, the origin uh, is very tough, uh, at, at least for a uh, for a normal civilian piece of mail on Myra Island. Um, finally, a lot of U.S. possessions uh, at that time had no post office at all, uh, and so the only proof you can have of 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 origin that's postal in nature is when a ship stops by. Now, this particular ocean adventure was really a power grab. Ostensibly, it was a National Geographic trip to Enderbury and Canton Islands to witness a solar eclipse that day. But actually, <clears throat> you don't need a Navy gunboat to witness <clears throat> a solar eclipse, <clears throat> but they did need a Navy gunboat to uh, to capture these islands from Britain, ironically, uh, and uh, they did so uh, 
under cover of witnessing a, a solar eclipse and then building a Pan Am uh, base because treaties at that time forbade the United States to build new military bases in the Pacific. So Pan Am built the, the Navy's bases for it uh, on these various islands. Uh, eventually, uh, the United States and, and Britain re reached an accord and, uh, and governed these islands as a, as a condominium uh, until they became independent. Now let's look at some of the remote places that we all uh, The Pitcairn Island is, is uh, so probably the most famous of the lot because of the, the descendants of the mutineers on the bounty uh, being basis of so much uh, romance and fiction and film and, and uh, adventure and so on. But this is a kind of a nice cover because it's a it's an unsealed printed matter uh, rate, properly rated uh, to New Zealand. I kind of like it. It's, a, it's an attractive cover. I also like to collect uh, inner island covers from the from the Pacific. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, New Hebrides uh, to the Gilberts. Uh, again, as far as I can tell, man for the teller. And here's another <coughs> inner island. This is, this is a waybill <coughs> for a parcel from a gardener island to Hull Island. Uh, about the only uh, kind of inner island postal relic I've been able to find, uh, except for contrivance. So we have to, and, and of course this is a very modern uh, cover from that origin, but kind of a cool one because uh, it's got the, uh, uh, the customs duties paid with British high value uh, postage dues. So the Pacific is just a wonderful place to, uh, to collect really obscure covers from. But um, for me, my, my biggest Pacific collection is the Galapagos, which is a tourist destination these days. Uh, but wasn't always. In fact, it wasn't until uh, officially until 1970. So almost any, and, and actually, I, I would say any cover from the Galapagos <coughs> before World War II is rare and usually expensive. World War II breaks the ice, <coughs> as we'll see. Now, this one has its own stamp story to it, because in 1933, Stamps Magazine, uh, in collaboration with the owner of this yacht, the Seth Parker, took orders for covers from collectors. And they printed up these caches, and they said, you're going to get a cover <coughs> from all these places all over the world that the Seth Parker is going to stop. And so you can see, this is the, the cachet that they printed up for the Galapagos. Well, they went bankrupt before they ever got to the Galapagos. So they mailed them uh, from Panama. And uh, that's, that's the story behind those covers. But you still see them offered as Galapagos cover. Now, this is a cover that's real. This one was, uh, was mailed from Post Office Bay uh, on Floriana Island, the same place where Charles Darwin sent his mail from uh, when he was there in 1835. So it's been the, the mail drop for, it's actually been there for 200 years because there's proof that mail was, outgoing mail was posted there about 200 years ago, literally. But this, this is an extremely rare cover, uh, posted by uh, the yacht Southern Cross on its round the world cruise which must have been aborted because they were sailing right into the war. Um, uh, this is uh, as far as they had gotten starting out uh, on the east coast of the United States, coming across Panama and so on. But another homeward bound uh, pleasure craft picked this up, carried it to California, and mailed it onward to uh, Yachting Magazine. Here's where the Galapagos finally get collected. Uh, during the war, the Navy has a base there, and so you can get these APO covers. Uh, they're, they're not cheap, by the way, I and mean, I, I think Dan Mayo probably would have 
put a hundred dollar price on that cup. Uh, but at least they, you know, they get down to uh, relatively uh, collector friendly levels compared to the, the pre war covers. In 1957, the Galapagos, the Ecuadorian government started issuing local stamps for the Galapagos. And uh, so now you can, you can collect covers that actually have this franking. Uh, this one is nice because it's, it's from the islands to the mainland uh, using one of the locals in uh, its original. But the, the system of using Post Office Bay as the mail drop continues to this very day. This is undated, but it's obviously from the postal code. It, it's a fairly modern cover deposited by a, a, a traveler at Post Office Bay and, and carried home by another traveler to, to Geneva and, and delivered. And, but this is, this is the most typical today uh, Galapagos mail. A, a, a tourist on a, on a cruise ship visits there, goes to the post office, the actual post office, uh, buys stamps, puts them on a, on a postcard, and so on. Uh, and if you follow that sequence, more or less, they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper uh, and more affordable as, as they come forward. Finally, let's talk about the Antipodes. This, this is the opposite side of the world from the United States. Uh, despite all you've uh, heard about the China syndrome, if you dig down through the other side of the earth and do not come to China, you come to the Indian Ocean. And there is very, very little land that's antipodal to the United States mainland. You can see these two islands and this one, all owned by the French. But the reason why I want to show you this map is because uh, almost every collector, me included, who likes polar stuff, gets one of these. This is from Kerberlin. Uh, and uh, you notice that the, that the franking is the uh, French Southern and Antarctic territories. Now let's go back to this map. And here's where it's from. Now that's that's probably what uh, northern Minnesota or Montana, something like that. Uh, the opposite. And we don't think of that as polar exactly. We don't think of that as an Arctic location. So how does this qualify as uh, an Antarctic uh, origin? Well, it doesn't really, but the French are very clever at cashing in on the, on the polar uh, philatelic Craze. Um, so that's my story. Uh, thank you for following me around. The world. I will answer any questions, but I'm especially interested in uh, either questions about or discussion about or suggestions for how to collect real places in the unusual. So you have a question. Can you do these like the geographic center of the United States is the, the pole point to match where that map would be placed? It's, it's just the, literally the opposite side of the world for yeah. every point in the United States. Okay. It's, 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 if you project the United States through a through transparent globe, that's the other side. Mm -hmm. oh. and what's your particular fascination with the lobby? Uh, well, I, I, I grew up with Darwin, and I actually attended the Darwin Centennial uh, at the University of Chicago in 1959, so I... I, I thought it might be five years more. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's probably where my fascination began. Uh, but I, I have to tell you, this collection is one where any place I don't have, when I get a chance, I have it. <laughs> that kind of collection. And that's sort of why I wanted to survey, you know, there's so many different ways you've got to try. You know, there, you will, if, you, if all you do is shop in dealers or, or uh, browse eBay or whatever, you'll never uh, 
get very far in it. You really got to. And what were you giving to these, your, your pen pals, what were you giving them in return? Stamps and covers, uh, U.S., mm -hmm. uh, mostly just used stuff. It's fairly common stuff. Well, I, I had everybody I knew was saving stamps for me. You know, and, and uh, the organizations I, I worked for and, and uh, worked with, we always used commemoratives and, and postage that was not what everybody used. So I, I had a lot of stuff to send. And, and most people, most of my pen pals wanted stamps, but some wanted covers. I could give them whatever they wanted. It was usually more than they had before. I, I wanted them to feel that I was being generous and, and see what they would come up with. Uh, you know, because once you're going to spend the minimum amount of postage, you might as well get your money's worth. And, and it wasn't costing me anything. Yeah. What's next? What are you looking for next? Um, well, right now I'm, I'm doing uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Airmail. Uh, and uh, the product has uh, gotten me uh, hooked in the, the current uh, the furious debate on uh, uh, the World War II transatlantic South, <laughs> South Atlantic uh, route debate. Thank you. 